Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech and more specifically, this is Likeable Science, a show, a show that Ethan Allen designed and invented and developed um, some time ago. And uh, we're still doing it, aren't we, Ethan? Yes, indeed, we are. It's good to be back doing the show with you again today. Yeah, same here. So today we have we have uh, the title of uh, So How Do You Make a Vaccine Anyway? It's a rhetorical question. But we thought we'd look into that because everybody talks about vaccines. It's it's the saving grace. It's what's going to get us out of this this terrible pandemic, um, and and to get all this various information from various people about when Gordo is coming, when 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 is he going to ride out of the east and or the west, whatever. And uh, yeah, it could be either way. Um, and and save us. He needs to save us all. But exactly what you know, we need to educate ourselves. What is a vaccine? And how do you make one? You want to start, Ethan? Sure. So you got, you got to understand the vaccines. To understand vaccines, you have to know a little bit about our immune systems first, our body's way of fighting off diseases. And because we live in a very dynamic world where disease organisms are always evolving, our immune systems, the ones that are successful, have evolved to deal with changing uh, foreign entities, changing pathogens, you know, nasty, nasty germs, basically. And so what vaccines do is prime our immune systems. They give them a little taste of this, of a nasty, nasty invader and get them ready, basically. So they are now prepared to launch a full-scale attack on any subsequent ones that come on in. Uh, that's sort of a, a very crude but general picture of how, uh, what vaccination is all about. Can you always do it? We developed a lot of vaccines against a lot of things. Many of them have been incredibly effective. Uh, vaccines are rightly credited with huge reductions in public health burdens from polio, from just a number of diseases, typhoid, diphtheria. Uh, the, the, they've reduced mortality from the flu. They, they just disease after disease after disease. Uh, vaccines have been a, a huge blessing with very, very minimal and few side effects, despite what the anti-vaxxer crowd insists. Mm. We should uh, talk about them too. Okay, well, so so I decide um, I'm a researcher or a company that has the facility to do research that I want to I want to jump into the fray. I want to make a vaccine against COVID. Wow. And furthermore, from the Chinese, you remember the Chinese, the, the, the clone food Chinese, <laughs> The Chinese gave us the uh, what do you call it the uh, the the, the uh, geno genome uh, for for this uh, virus that was pretty nice of them, and we have it now from them. So we, one step of the research is already done because we know what this virus is thanks to them, um, and um, and then we can look at it and slice it and dice it and figure out exactly what it is. But given the genome which we have. Um, what do we do at, at that point? Because we have to find a way to, uh, as you said, um, provoke the body's uh, immune response to this particular pathogen um, in order to make us immune. Right. Um, this is not easy, especially with uh, a virus that's complex and tricky. As this is more complex and tricky than other ones we've dealt with. So what's step one? Well, there's a lot of different routes you can take. That is, you can take the whole virus and kill it, basically, inactivate it, soak it in formalin, for instance, uh, and essentially inject some of that, now, a now dead virus, basically. So your body sees that, knows that virus, it uh, will recognize it in the future, and hopefully it will be immune against it. That's fine. It's tough to make enough of that in big enough quantities to uh, uh, to be good. You've got to be sure you kill 100% of it too before you use it. You can take that same virus and sort of weaken it, uh, selectively breed it for a bunch of generations and make it weak. And then you use that and inject a live but weakened virus. Uh, and your body can use that to, to build up uh, immunity. You can take a fragment of the virus uh, like one of its one of these protein spikes that it has, that corona on the virus, uh, crown of little spikes, which are which are what are recognized and bind to the, the cells, um, and use one of those, you, or a bunch of them, 
Uh, the new thing now they're doing though is using either DNA or RNA from the virus and in a coronavirus case, RNA, it's an RNA virus. Uh, and that has some real interesting potential. That has, that's a, that's a brand new technology. It's been tested in the lab and looks really good. If it works the way they think it will, it'll, uh, the Pfizer folks say they've got a, a version that self amplifies. Basically you get one copy into a cell and it rather like a virus actually causes the cell to crank out a lot more copies of that and, and, and give a stronger immune response. Mm. So um, it has not yet been extensively tested in people that RNA or DNA uh, vaccine technology, uh, but it, it would skip a number of the steps in making it. It would make it cheaper, easier to produce, faster to produce, cheaper. Uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of advantages. So they talk about well, they talk about um, candidates, mm -hmm. and it sounds like they're you know it's just like Edison uh, finding. Um, the right kind of filament to put in his light bulb, you know, Eureka, and he found tungsten or something back in about 1885 or so. Um, that was the right candidate. So what is a candidate? How do you even select somebody, something you would consider a candidate for a vaccine? So basically back in January and February, labs around the world that, that deal in, in vaccines basically saw this or that and even develop stuff for vaccines, even the earlier stage, saw this need and began testing a lot of candidates. And I'm sure they tested all those things. I'm sure they, you know, some labs took the live coronavirus and killed it and, you know, began working with that and seeing how that worked. I'm sure some took and started breeding that virus and attenuating its strength and, and developing that line. Others took chunks out of that virus, uh, you know, pieces of its spikes of its protein coat um, and so others have been working now on the DNA and RNA. There was something, as I recall, like 150 different candidates, uh, candidate vaccines, of which, you know, a dozen or so will probably prove pretty interesting. You know, half a dozen will look like pretty good and we'll settle on one or two or three, you know. So I, I take it that if, if I'm a laboratory working on this, I'm going to go through a bunch of candidates and then I'm going to settle on the one that's most promising and focus my attention, my resources on that one and, and, and work with that uh, to the exclusion of other possible candidates, at least, at least in, in the effort of the moment. Am I right about that? Or, or do they continue to work on a number of candidates in parallel? I, I would think most labs would work on one or at most two or three very close to related uh, approaches just from mm -hmm. how it has to be done in the lab. The processes that have to be done are all gonna be Specific, the same lab that's doing whole virus work can't be doing the RNA work necessarily. Those are two very different kinds of approaches. Mm. So requiring sort of different equipment and different mindsets, really. Is it dangerous? Uh, there is some danger to doing that kind of work. Yes, absolutely. I mean, particularly if you're when you're trans, you're transferring live virus around, right? You've got to, you need to take some precautions. Yeah. So what what do I what do I need? I need I need a laboratory. I need some. I need some samples, I guess, of the of the virus. Right. And then I need um, I need people to help me um, deteriorate the virus, you know, to the point where it's safe enough to be a vaccine. Um, and I need people to test it once I once I have a, a candidate worth looking at. Right. Um, so what what's the magnitude of of the facility? I mean, we're talking about a, a city block worth of laboratories or just a little wee 5,000 space, 5,000 foot space? Yeah, again, it sort of depends on the, on the approach because again, while what you describe is a fairly typical process and which could probably be done in, you know, could be done in 5,000 square foot laboratory, you'd never produce much vaccine out of that, but you could get, you could do the process and show proof of principle. But the RNA, uh, DNA vaccines, basically you don't really even need a virus to start with. You can actually build that RNA now yourself, basically sort of tinker toy kits and put together a sequence. We know what the sequence is because we've got, as you point out, we got the, the genome from it. So we know what sequences are needed or might be useful. And so you can just build those yourself without ever sort of seeing the live virus. Uh, and 
then moves on to the next stage of testing those. You know. how, how do you build? How do you build it from the genome? I mean, what do you? You have you, you don't need people for this. You don't need human subjects for this. No, you just no. need to be able to look at it with a microscope and and sort yeah. of uh, take a it's look at the genome, map the genome again. It's it's not it's sub microscopic. I mean, smaller than you're going to see in a microscope. This is essentially fancy biochemistry, but it's uh, the folks who do CRISPR and and the uh, allied technologies have developed a lot of basic kits where you can start slapping the core elements of our reproductive material of our DNA or our RNA together uh, base by base, basically, and build strands with certain sequences just as you want them, literally from, from little starting blocks of, of the individual nucleotides and individual backbone bases. You can just build them up um, in whatever sequence you want. And so, yeah, once we, since we know the virus's genome, you can, if you figure out what codes for what, you would take an RNA that codes for the spike proteins, basically, and select that and just build that little stretch of RNA, which is actually sort of smaller and cheaper and simpler to do that than sort of going through all the process of inactivating a bunch of viruses or attenuating the viruses or all or anything yeah. like that. And plus, once you have that recipe, you can then just crank it out en masse and you can crank out a lot of it. Um, I want to talk about that, but what about the the strands? You talked about the strands of the RNA. What, what do I, is what they have this in Long's drugstore? Where do I get that? <laughs> <laughs> there's there's about a mile of it in every cell in your body. You know? Okay, so you got a lot of it. Uh, I don't know. That's actually basically true. Um, RNA is a little different, a little a little shorter, easier to work with than the big DNA molecules, but. It's again, it's a, it's a same, it's parts of that same structure, parts of that same sequence of molecules that, that are spelling out, that are basically a code that, that tells proteins how to build, how to assemble themselves together. And so the protein- You go in with a little pincer there and you move things around. I mean, how do you change the, you know, the elements of the RNA? More or less, you, you do that biochemically. Um, that they have developed these kits which allow you to sort of, you know, add a teaspoon from packet A to a teaspoon from packet B, and you're guaranteed that you're gonna get a bunch of compound C. And then you take another teaspoon from compound D and add that on, and that lets you add in you know, compound E, and just builds itself up. I mean, literally, you're synthesizing molecules from the ground up. You know. So it's, it's synthetic. This is not living material. Right, right. The RNA stuff they're doing now, they're not, they're not extracting it from cells. They're building it, actually. Yeah, this is... Yeah, you know, this is again, it's nanotechnology, it's material science, it's sort of in, in a, I don't want to is, say all is it CRISPR? Around, it, you and I have talked about a CRISPR right. a number of times. A CRISPR, CRISPR, you can use CRISPR in this to get in there and, and start editing stuff. So you could yank out a chunk of the RNA or DNA from the virus and then edit it using CRISPR if you wanted, for instance. But okay, so, so it, sorry, go ahead. A lot of them are actually just literally building it, you know. Uh, so yeah. now you've built it to whatever specs you have in your design plan, I guess, right. thinking that know. those specs would actually give you um, a uh, material that would improve your own, you know, the human immune system. Right. Um, how do you find out whether you're right? <laughs> so they, they do a number of tests, ultimately leading into animal tests. Um, there are various model animals who you can in fact, or you give this vaccine to, you infect them with COVID and you see if, if they get sick or don't get sick. And then ultimately it has to be tried out on people because that's sort of the, the $64 question is, does it work on us? Because we are different from our model animals. The vaccines behave differently. The virus behaves differently. So just the virus and a vaccine will work in a model animal does not necessarily mean they'll work together in, in humans. So, so what, what, what kind of model animals are we talking about? Don't say bats. <laughs> no, no. I, I believe they're just commonly, we'll start with things like mice and rats. Uh, I've, I've not looked real deeply in this. They'll, I think they oftentimes go into primates. I suspect they're skipping some of these steps and going doing small scale tests in humans pretty much, you know, as soon as they have any indication that stuff basically reasonably safe in animals. It's not going to kill you immediately. 
Um, <laughs> you know, they, they want to move fast on this, and you know, it's uh, you got to you got to be ready to scale it up, and that's a problem in itself. I mean, you know. So, it, so in the case of an animal, if we'll go to humans in a minute. You would you would infect the animal with uh, with coronavirus. I guess different animals are affected different ways. So you'd you'd have to find an animal a subject okay. animal that does something like a human. Okay, exactly. and then and then you give him once you know you have infected him, you give him this uh, RNA material, and see if it stops the virus from from proliferating. Well, that that's one thing that see that's one of the two ways that viruses can be used. That's that's what, what you just described as so-called a therapeutic use. If you're already sick, you get a vaccine to help you get better. The real power of vaccines, though, is to be used prophylactically. So that is, you don't get your animal sick with COVID first, you give them the RNA vaccine first, and then expose them to COVID, and they hopefully don't get sick. And that's, okay. you know, that's that's the real power is, is you vaccinate a bunch of people around the world, and the virus got nowhere to go. It's not, it can't find a good home, can't live happily in people, and it just disappears. So in the animals, anyway, you'd have a control group. You'd have one group of animals where you know that animal is going to get sick, and you infect that animal and see how the virus goes. Then the other group, you, you give them the, uh, vaccine. the vaccine, and then you infect the, the animal right. and see how that goes. Exactly. And if it's better with the vaccine, you know you got something. Exactly. And then eventually you take that same kind of trial in people, first just giving them the vaccine, see if they don't react badly to that, and then eventually challenging them with uh, COVID. Uh, after being vaccinated and see again running with a control group who doesn't get the vaccine and you can see why this gets to be problematical because this means you essentially are asking people to take a risk and get infected with a potentially dangerous potentially deadly virus you know, um, well let's talk about people so i need subjects now i'm convinced that my selected animal has told me enough to make me you know make at least a preliminary conclusion that my candidate, this RNA candidate, um, is likely or has some probability of success. Right. And so I need I need two people. One person. This is a horrible, kind, horrible kind of um, analysis. But one person, I give them the virus, and I just like the animals, right? I give them the virus and see how that goes. Or maybe he already has it. Maybe he has tested positive. So I'm not I'm not in, in, involved in that moral dilemma, right? He tested positive, and I watch how that goes. Um, and I do not give him the RNA vaccine. Right. Um, and the other one is he had well, and I didn't get this right. right. No, That's I got it wrong. You can um, do that. I mean, you neither can... neither one of them have the virus, right? Well, you're going to have to do all those. You're going to have to give it to people who have the virus and the people who don't have the virus, really. Okay. Um, all right. And okay. They tell you different things. And it depends, yes, in this country, that's a problem setting up those groups, particularly the ones where you're infecting people and not giving them the, uh, the, the vaccine. And if you live in a place like China, that's probably easier to do that kind of research because with the powers granted to the government there, and with the lesser emphasis on individual human rights, but um, it's easy enough to find 10 or 20 subjects from a jail or whatever, and just make them your subjects, you know. Regardless so with my control groups over here, and with the vaccine over here in the in the the non-control group, the real group, I want to see if that same vaccine that I was using on the animals has an effect of ameliorating the you know the infection or right. stopping stopping making this particular uh, subject uh, immune from right. from COVID. Ideal. Um, yeah. Okay, and so I guess I you know I have to pay these people, don't I? That's well, why in these trials country, are yes. so expensive. Yeah, right. what, what what can you expect to get paid if you're a subject in a trial? I, you know, I actually don't know what, what they what they would pay subjects. They'll do the initial small groups of literally ten or twenty subjects. You know, you don't want just one because one person tells you nothing really. It can be just a fluke. But if you get a group of ten people who who get the vaccine and ten people who don't, and then both get infected with the virus at the same time three or four weeks later, you can look and you can say, hey, how did these 10 people do versus how did the other 10 people do? And if you see a major difference in the health outcomes, all 10 people who didn't get the vaccine are now reasonably sick, or maybe you know one of them very sick. 
and only two or three of the people in the vaccine group are only a little bit sick, you can say, hey, you know, something looks really good here, right? This looks like it's a pretty good, pretty effective vaccine. Um, then you'll have one tested on groups of probably several dozen people, maybe a couple hundred people. Uh, again, trying to get a broad cross-section of population, young, old, different ethnic groups, both sexes, you know, people in good health, people in not such good health, and track all this carefully match your groups, watch to see does it have better effects in some groups than others. You know, uh, it, it's, it's not a straightforward business. Uh, well, it gets, uh, gets complicated because <clears throat> you want to put the vaccine out there to a number of people who might be exposed. Right. Uh, and you don't know who will be exposed among that group. So you have to have it big enough so that you catch some who ultimately perchance get exposed. Yeah. Um, it's complicated. Yeah, if, if you do it on the, just truly on a population the sampling, right, you, you have to have fairly large groups. So both groups will have exposed and non-exposed people, basically. Um, yeah. So I guess, and one of the things that people say or that I've seen written about them is that they're concerned, researchers are concerned that giving the virus, rather giving the vaccine could in itself be dangerous. Uh, how does that work? Yeah, vaccines in general are incredibly safe. Uh, very occasionally people are allergic to some of the, the preservatives or carrier substances or things in the vaccine. You do get a few odd cases of people reacting very, very badly to uh, you know, to either the, the, the vaccine substance itself. Uh, you know, in general, though, you know, for every real bad reaction you get to a, va a vaccination, if you weren't using that vaccine, you'd probably have 100 deaths instead, you know, compared to one sort of bad health reaction, you know. So uh, it's, it's really, it, you know, the, the, the cost benefit ratio is, is tremendous on most vaccines, you know. Okay. And I think so the RNA. Uh, promises to be very, very safe. Yeah. So let's assume that the RNA candidate looks good. First, it looks good in animals and selected animal. Then it looks good in people. Um, compares well against the control group. Um, and uh, it looks like you need to go to the next step. Mm -hmm. I know the FDA requires a, a number of steps. There's three but those steps, uh, larger groups of people, Yes. more testing, more data gathering, and so forth. So how does that work? Right. So phase one trials are very small. Get literally maybe 20 people. Yeah, give, give it to 10 of them. Don't give it to the other 10. Expose them to the virus. Check it out. Phase two is sort of intermediate. And then phase three, yeah, you want thousands of people in these, in these trials, ideally. Um, so you really get a good sampling across the population. You, you can ha have statistically meaningful subgroups of men versus women. People, you know, under 20, people 20 to 40, people 40 to 60, people over 60. Um, you get statistically meaningful groups of different ethnic groups, you know, and all that was, you know, when I say statistically meaningful, you've got to have probably several dozen people or at least a dozen or so people in, in your control group and in your trial group from each of those subgroups. So that's why it needs thousands of people. And yes, as you say, you're taking a lot of data, you're following them for, reasonable periods of time. You know, th those are big, expensive things to do, phase three trials. Um, you have to have all mm -hmm. kinds of, as you can imagine, legal protection written in mm -hmm. uh, for, for those. Well, they say, you know, they, they started saying this back in February, that to, to design and, uh, you know, find a, a vaccine would take a year. Right. Uh, where, where, does, where, does the, where does that time go that year? Is it all in these trials? Um, a certain amount of it is in the trials, yeah. A certain amount of it's also in the, the actual development of the vaccine. That's that latter part has gone very quickly for some of these. Some of these vaccines have literally been designed and built in, you know, a matter of days almost. Um, that, that's that's how our our new technologies are, are really allowing us to do do things. And so yeah, then then you've got to begin to determine the safety and efficacy, and that's that does take a while. Um, you can't you can't rush those human trials. You can't be sloppy with how you set them up because if you don't do them right, they can give you misleading results. Uh, you've got to be sure you know every T is crossed, every I is dotted. There, there are 
you know, it's their fancy legal contracts basically between you and, and your test groups, you know, because uh, those people are putting certain things themselves at risk, right? Uh, so you have to follow the, the protocols for testing. Right. I, I don't know if that's the FDA or the CDC, but one of those two agencies. And, right. and uh, you're gonna follow the protocols, but you also have to follow the data and you have to determine how many people have uh, an effective reaction and how many people don't, how many people have a bad reaction, something happens to them, uh, yep. and who knows why. Right. You've got to really follow them closely. So I guess it means you got to talk to them all the time. If you have thousands of people in this, um, this phase, what you call it, phase three? Right. The your phase three trial. Right. You've got to talk to them. you got to call them in. you got to you know, Monitor, take blood examples. Examine them. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So it involves a lot of doctors, a lot of patient time. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, they're, they're hugely, I mean, this is for a typical drug, right? Uh, a pharmaceutical company will spend now billions of dollars developing it. And a lot of that is in the, uh, is in the big testing phases, you know, because it was just, yeah, they're expensive to do. So are we looking for a vaccine that's perfect? No. Or nearly perfect? No. Nearly perfect would do. Halfway perfect is probably good enough. Yeah, you know, if it's 30 or 40 percent effective, it's probably better than nothing, you know. When you say 30, 40 percent, you mean 30 or 40 percent of the time it protects the uh, individual patient from getting sick. Right. It either it stops, immunizes them. Yeah. Right. It either stops them or it reduces the severity, you know, so far fewer, you know, only a small portion of your patients proceed to the more extreme forms of the disease. You know, they, they when they do get. Uh, hospitalized, they, their stays are significantly shorter. <clears throat> fewer, than, fewer of them go on to ventilators. You know, all these, you know, you can measure it in a lot of different ways how effective a, a vaccine is. Uh, yeah, but it's graduated. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's um, nuanced uh, because you're not, it, it's not yes or no. It may be very nuanced in how long does he stay in the hospital? Uh, right. What kind of side effects does he have? Um, right. what, what kind of residual medical issues does he have? Right. Oh, wow, there must be, you know, hundreds of fields on that database. Yeah, and then how long does that immunity last? You know, uh, you know ideally, it gives you lifelong immunity with, with, you know, one or two doses of the vaccine, um, like with the Sabine and Salk polio vaccines. Uh, but uh, a lot of other things like our annual flu vaccines, right? You have to change those each year because the flu virus is sort of constantly evolving and new strains are popping up. And we don't yet know this coronavirus, it looks reasonably stable. It's not as uh, tricky as HIV, for instance, which evolves extremely quickly and morphs into different strains very, very fast. Yeah. Which makes it very hard to treat. Although we, we don't know for sure. We're only, we're only six months into this uh, virus and we could have a mutation right. on our hands. Exactly. Um, it could be next, so, next season. It could come back in a you know altered form. The vaccine for this one might not work against. Yeah. But let's assume there's lots of pressure to develop the vaccine, and therefore, I mean, and lots of expectation it'll be done in a year. Although I, I don't think if uh, Anthony Fauci were here with us today, um, you know, you look a little bit like him actually, Ethan. Uh, <laughs> if Anthony Fauci were here with us today, he would say, no, it's not a year, it's a year and a half, maybe more. He's a conservative person. Right. Um, and so the question is, if you only have a year, a year and a half, you can't do trials to determine how long the effect of the vaccine will last. You, can, you have to wrap it into that period. So we will not know exactly how long the vaccine will last. Right. Yeah. That's one of the things we're not going to know as we start distributing our, our first rounds of vaccine, probably, is, is whether it's a three month, you know, protection or a lifelong protection. We'll probably have some clues, but uh, yeah. yeah, we won't know for okay. some years, really. OK, well, let's go to the, 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 the penultimate thing, and that is uh, how do you manufacture this in large doses? You, you, you know that it works on your, your sample, your sample, or at least you're satisfied that the doses you gave, uh, and you determine the right doses, by the way, by virtue of these trials, <clears throat> now you have to take those same doses and put it in a little thing, a little mm -hmm. test tube or whatever you put it in. Um, and you have to make, how about 
eight billion of them. Right. Uh, how do you do that? Yeah, I mean, and that's a problem. The traditional way of doing, of making vaccines on mass involves basically culturing them in eggs, literally in chicken eggs. Individual chicken eggs had to be injected with a virus, uh, cultured for some period of time. The virus pulled out, very tedious process, very hard to scale up. I mean, handling egg after egg after egg, literally. The new RNA viruses, that's one of the beauties of them. The new RNA vaccines, potentially, they can just be cranked out with, with a, any sort of you know, molecular synthesizer kit, basically. And so they will be cheaper, they'll be easier to produce in larger quantities. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of people hoping very strongly that these RNA candidate vaccines will work uh, because that will make everyone's lives much simpler. Uh, in, in terms of producing them. Yes, so well, I guess you take the RNA material and you put it in some kind of solution and you put that in a, in a little tube and, um, and then the person who administers the, the vaccine is, is gonna take a hypodermic, draw it out of the tube uh, and, then, and then put it in your arm. Is that, is that what the presumptive arrangement is? Yeah, I mean, again, there's, there's different ways. The, the polio vaccine, they went from the shots to the oral vaccine. The uh, sugar. Right, on, on, on sugar cube, you probably remember from your childhood and mine. I right? do, I yeah, do remember. Right. Yeah. I, I like that. I like the sugar cube much better than the needle <laughs> in the arm. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I don't, I don't know, I'm guessing the RNA stuff is gonna have to be injectable just because unless it's, but they may have coatings now where they can wrap it up in indigestible things you know, and make, you know, protect it from the digestive system. Uh, there, there's the packaging for sort of virus vir vaccines is getting, uh, or for any drugs these days, is also getting very fancy. They can put protective coatings on it that dissolve only under certain conditions in your body and you know, uh, let it circulate and you know, yeah. do all that thing. So. As long as they don't have to stick it up my nose, you know. <laughs> now, the, the big issue now is there are 8 billion people plus in the world today. And um, this, the first question is, uh, how many of the 8 billion do we need to uh, uh, inoculate, uh, vaccinate, yeah, and sort of before, before well, we get a, 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 the desired population result? So, yeah, and there's some debate about that. The, the estimates that I've heard range from somewhere probably around 60% of the population ultimately should be vaccinated to really get a good herd, immu herd immunity going, to really spread, spread the vulnerable individuals out so far that the vaccine, that the virus will basically lose its hosts. You know? um, so that would say we're gonna need, you know, 5 billion doses of it. Um, you should, you know, Again, there are people who can do these calculations, epidemiologists who say, oh, a lot smaller percentage of the population will, will begin to see a good effect already, particularly if you focus it, you vaccinate the most at-risk people in the most sort of at-risk places, uh, you'll, you'll break, you'll stop these spikes from occurring uh, in, a, in a big way, you know. Um, but again, that's a very tricky thing when you get, yes, you have the first two million doses, who gets them, you know? Is it right? Well, like the first it, people who have to get them are, uh, uh, Donald Trump and his family, am I right? Only, only joking. Uh, <laughs> but, but is, it, you know, is it the first line doctors and nurses and public health care workers, yeah. EMTs who deal with these yeah, people? Because they're going to be out there administering this vaccine. You know? Yeah. And they're getting... but I, I suggest that there could be a huge and un, very socially unjust uh, disparity on yes. who gets it first. And, uh, and, and there could be corruption involved in that because everybody wants to be saved. Yeah. You, you, you bet there will be. You know, there's certainly pressure for it, you know. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, who who wants expect... to give it to the people in Bangladesh? Right. Right. Who want to give it to the people in Cincinnati? I mean, we've already seen that this, the COVID pandemic has made very clear there's a real, there's real inequity in our culture, you know. The, the haves are, get COVID at a lot lower rates than the have-nots, basically, you know. Uh, the people who, who are sort of at the bottom of the socioeconomic scale suffer disproportionately from, uh, uh, in terms of the rates of infection, the severity of the infections, the death rates they get from it, on all those measures, um, you know, you see that. Well, that's, 
That's one reason why we should have the World Health Organization involved in the distribution of any vaccine. Absolutely. Because they're likely to be more fair and equitable about it on a, on a global basis. Absolutely. Um, and, and as I remember, there were three places in the world where they're working on a vaccine. One was Germany, one was the US, and I can't remember the third, uh, somewhere in Europe. It was the France or, or England. UK, the UK two. is doing some very good work. Uh -huh. uh, China is doing some very good work. Um, they have, of course, a high vested interest mm. in developing things and you know, saving the world from the disaster they unleashed on it. Uh, uh, but yes, a lot of US labs, labs all around the world are working. A lot of them are collaborating very freely and, and well with each other because uh, the people who do this kind of work understand, you know, uh, you work together on this and you get the solutions a lot faster. You know, you, you, you spot the error in somebody else's work probably before you'll spot it in your own. They'll probably spot the shortcomings of your, of your design before you'll see them. So, yeah. That reminds me of uh, something that happened a couple of months ago where uh, Trump went to a particular uh, ph pharmaceutical uh, research laboratory in Germany and tried to buy their work and their scientists and take them away from Germany. And uh, Angela Merkel and the individual scientists involved said, no, you're not going to do that. That would have been the opposite of what you're talking about in terms of collaboration. Right. Uh, yeah. But, uh, I wanted to ask you one more thing, and that is, and that is, um, you know, what should we be looking for? I mean, let, let's say we all have an interest in knowing about this. And there are so many news sources, so many people, so many media, you know, want to be, you know, helpful. Mm -hmm. and who want to tell us what's going on, but we have to be discerning in what we read and hear and think about it. How, how can we best track on this? What should we be looking for to either be encouraged or discouraged over the next few months? Well, I mean, I, I would hope that the good people, the people who are mapping in the cases, for instance, like Johns Hopkins has a very good interactive map and all kinds of trend line analyses, all kinds of fancy stuff. And I would hope that we will see uh, the US and for that matter cases all around the globe start to, to level off and go down. Certainly individual countries have done that very successfully. Um, uh, some of them, places like Iceland, people don't even socially distance, don't wear masks and they're fine. They basically sort of close the whole book on it. Um, New Zealand has done a, a grand job too. New Zealand has virtually no cases. Um, some of the small Pacific Island nations, by shutting themselves down and closing their borders, did it fine. They, they've killed their economies, of course. Uh, that's not so good, but um, they, they've kept themselves COVID free. Um, so, yeah, you, you look at that. The one thing you don't want to do is sort of believe the hype that you'll hear, the latest Facebook post, you know, the latest Twitter feed from anyone from our president on down, um, you know, that, that says miracle cures, you know. Here today, send 995. You know, uh, <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, so follow, yeah, follow reliable sources like Johns Hopkins. You know, get, go to the CDC website. You know, they have good, accessible information about COVID. It's up to date. It's it's edited and vetted by experts. You know, um, you know, yeah. Uh, so there there are places to to get good information. Um, yeah, and then one day, one day, uh, the assistant to your favorite uh, doctor will call you on the phone or send you a little email message and say, it's time for you to come down and get a shot, Jay. Mm -hmm. And I'll be down there in about six seconds. <laughs> how, how, how about you, Ethan? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, and, and the line will be there ahead of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been very instructive, uh, very educational, and uh, a, a very important discussion to have to sort of clarify where we are and where we're going and how we're going to get there. Um, thank you so much, Ethan, for looking into it and talking to us about it. Well, thank you, Jay. It's always a pleasure talking to you. You ask such good questions, and, you know, have such a good mind about thinking ways to think about this thing. Well, thank you. You're a pure scientist, Ethan. I really appreciate that. And, and we'll do this again, I promise. Promise yeah. me now, too. Sounds good. <laughs> Take care. I'll, I'll right. Stay, I'll stay I'll safe. Up.